Can I challenge you today? I'm going to challenge myself too. In light of all that's been going on, I want to challenge us to put our faith over our fears. Sometimes you can't control fear because it just comes on you and it's just all up in your grill. I mean, it's just all over you because the circumstances make you afraid. But my challenge today is to place faith over your fears. When, when we were in school, the teacher would give you a test. Sometimes it would be a pop quiz. Sometimes it would be a major midterm or final exam. The test was always designed to see whether you had learned what was taught in preparation for where you were going next, the next grade level. So to go from one grade level to the next grade level, it involved a test. Not too many kids that I knew growing up or adults in, in the, my graduate education got all excited about a test, but they knew it was part of the curriculum. Part of the curriculum for your life and my life by God is a test. Now, a good teacher will only test you over information taught you. In other words, they don't give you tests over information you are not supposed to know, but information you're supposed to know, grasp, and be able to recite or utilize. Throughout Jesus' walk with his disciples, he would give them tests. And what he would be testing is their faith. Whether they believed what they heard or whether they were doing what a lot of us do every Sunday, just say amen without adopting and incorporating it into our functional lives. Moving it from theory to activity. One of those events is found in Mark chapter 4. I love this, this event. Jesus has been teaching like crazy. And he's been teaching about the kingdom of God. And he was just, just been laying it on all day. And he was explaining to his own disciples so that they would understand this rule of God and understand how they would live their lives underneath God and how they would have confidence in the God that they were to follow. On the next day, Jesus says to his followers, let us go to the other side. That is the other side of this eight mile track across the Sea of Galilee. So they all get in their boats because they're hanging out with Jesus. It says, as they were going along, verse 37 says, there arose a fierce gale of wind and waves that were breaking over the boat, so much so that the boat was already filling up. Now you have to understand a lot of these guys are fishermen. So they're used to being in the water. They're used to wind. They're used to waves. They understand how to roll in this environment. But this was different. The Greek word here is the word lilac. A lilac is a windstorm. It's, it's a storm. The Sea of Galilee sits uh, inside of a mountain range. And so sometimes when the wind blows up, it acts like a funnel and sucks it down, creating a major disturbance. When they left, everything was fine, but on their way, things got crazy. They were in a lilac. We're in a lilac. <laughs> Corona is a lilac. Economic <laughs> uh, loss is a lilac. People being laid off is a lilac. Some stores not getting filled up as quickly that you need, you need supply. That's a lilac. People who are in the hospital in a lilac. A lilac is this storm that comes out of nowhere that disrupts your ordered life, that brings adversity and discouragement. That's what they're in. But please notice something. They're in a storm while they're also in the will of God. Did you hear that? Being in the will of God doesn't mean it's not going to thunderstorm on you. People ask, why? Why am I going through this when I'm serving God? Well, teachers give tests to good students and bad students, right? 
So they are in the will of God and in a storm because both can happen simultaneously. Don't ever let anybody tell you if you're in the will of God, it won't rain. Sometimes you haven't seen rain until you're in the will of God. So you can be out of the will of God and in a storm, but they are in the will of God and in a storm. The boat is filling up. Now watch this. It says in verse 38 of Mark 4, Jesus himself was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Hello. What good is a Savior who's going to sleep on you when you're in a storm? Have you ever noticed when you were taking the test how silent the teacher was? You're in there struggling with the test, and the teacher will tell you, silent, please. The teacher will get quiet. Sometimes they even walk out the room. Sometimes when you're in a storm, Jesus will get quiet on you. The telephone line will seem busy. He'll seem like a million miles away. You won't be feeling him. Jesus is asleep. But, but notice, he's not just asleep, he's snoring. Because <laughs> it tells us he sleep on a cushion. Now, if you sleep on a cushion, that doesn't mean you, 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 you're doing that. You're not nodding. If you put a cushion as a pillow, he probably had a my pillow. You know, he got a, he got a pillow under him. If you put a pillow under you, that means you meant to go to sleep. You sleeping on purpose. So Jesus intentionally goes to sleep when his followers are in trouble. If you're in the will of God right now, you're serving the Lord, you're obeying God, but you're still housed up with this virus, you still got your economic concerns, and Jesus seems far away, far away. Uh, he's there, but he's just not moving yet. It says he was asleep in the stern on a pillow. And they woke him. That concept is they had to shake and bake. They had to, they had to get him up. They said, come on now, you can't be sleeping at a time like this, Jesus. And said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Whoa. That's what it feels like when you're in a test, you're in his will, and you can't hear from him. Don't you care? How can you be quiet at a time like this? How can you sleep? when we are scared to death. Now, there were three storms happening at the same time. There is the external storm. That's the winds and the waves putting the water on the boat that was threatening their physical lives, okay? It's like this virus that threatens our physical well-being. There was this external storm that was invading them. But then there was an internal storm because they were very much afraid. They're going to be told, why are you so afraid? So they are fearful for their lives. Now for professional fishermen, of which a number of these men were, to be scared for their lives mean this is not a regular storm. This is something that can hurt you. This is something that can, that can, that can take you under. So there's this external storm. Then there is this emotional storm. But then there was the worst storm of all, a spiritual storm. Because they said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we are struggling? Do you not care that we are hurting? Do you not care? Because sometimes when you're in a crisis, it feels like. God doesn't care. Because if he cared, like Martha and Mary said, if you would have been here, if you would have been here, if you hadn't delayed a few days, we wouldn't be going through this. We're going through this. Come on, Jesus. Sometimes, to tell the truth, you want to throw a, a red flag out on God. You football people know what that is. That's when the coach reaches in his pocket pulls out a red flag and throws it on the field because he believes that the ref has made a mistake. Ref has made a bad call and I want to challenge it. Sometimes you want to ask God why. You, you, you don't know why he's allowed this. Don't you care? Don't, don't you care what I'm going through? This red flag, you, this is a bad call. And yet they're in a storm. Jesus is asleep. 
They wake him up and they got a storm on it, on the inside and a storm in their soul. You don't care. Where is God when it hurts? Jesus gets up. In verse 39, and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. Some of your versions say, peace, be still. Well, now, wait a minute. If peace has to be still, that means peace must be moving. See, we need to understand a little bit about peace. Peace has nothing to do with external circumstances. Peace has to do with internal calm, regardless of external circumstances. That's why the Bible calls it the peace that passes understanding, because you don't understand why you would have it, given, given what's going on around you. This is a time to be in turmoil, and you are calm when everything around you is collapsing. It's like uh, Rahab being calm in her house when the walls of Jericho are falling down. <laughs> Peace is being able to rest in God, even though everything is rocky around you. He tells peace to hush, Shh. be still, cool out, calm down, chill. Jesus speaks to nature. And when he says, hush, be still, immediately the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. See, that's how when you know it's God, because it's calm you didn't expect. It's peace that passes understanding. Now, this leads to Jesus asking a question. Why are you afraid? Verse 40 says, how is it that you have no faith? Now, that seems like an odd question. We're in a storm. The boat's filling up. Our very lives are threatened. You're asleep. And you're going to ask us, why are we so afraid? And how is it we have no faith? That's almost like asking a swimmer, why are you wet? I mean, <laughs> the question doesn't make sense. I can see Peter, because he's the one who liked to talk, saying, oh, let's see. Maybe we're a little bit afraid because we're getting ready to die. I mean, come on, Jesus, come on. I don't understand the question. So here it is. As we face the crisis that we're dealing with and the ones that will come after this. When in, you're in the will of God and it's not working out. And Jesus says, why are you afraid? Meaning you shouldn't be. And why do you have, it says no faith, because their little faith was gone. Here's the test. Jesus said before they left, let us go to the other side. Let me repeat that. Jesus said before they left, let us go to the other side. The test was, will you believe my word or will you believe your problem? The test was, is what I say more potent than what you see? Faith is the evidence of things not seen. You see the storm. That's real. You don't deny the virus. It's real. You don't deny the problem. It's real. You don't deny the finances. But what did I say? I said, let us. I didn't say let me. I said, all oh, y'all, let us go to the other side. Other side, other side, other side. Which means we all going to make it. So I let a storm come in to see whether the amens you said on Sunday, you're believing in your storm on Monday, or whether you're just talking a good game because you're not, it's not raining yet. God wants to appeal, wants his people to appeal to his word in the midst of their storm because the storms of life are tests, and tests are always designed to show us the level of our faith and to develop us to the next level of spiritual maturity. God wants to grow us through a storm. Are you growing in this quarantine? Or are you controlled by your fear? Or have you decided that I'm going to go with God's word and I'm going to let that trump my fear? My faith will trump my fear. This is a time 
to have biblical faith. That's not a feeling. You've heard me say it before. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. Hey, hey guys, God said we're going to make it to the other side. So he's in a pillow. He's got, he's got a my pillow. Let me get my my pillow. Y'all get y'all my pillow. He sleep. Let's all sleep because he said we're going to make it to the other side. Since he's not worried and he's with us, then we're not going to worry either. He's on the boat. He's sleeping. And he told us we're going to make it to the other side. So either he's lying or he's trustworthy. See, a lot of Christians haven't decided whether Jesus is trustworthy or not, whether his word is true, whether his word is real, whether what he says has, has meat to it. It's time for faith to trump fear. You can't always stop fear from coming, but you can keep it from living in you. He says, why do you have no faith? Now, I don't understand this, guys. I've been doing all this teaching, all these parables about my authority, all these parables about the word of God. I've been showing you my power and you still don't get it. Yes, I let the storm come on purpose because I want to see where you are. And I want you to see where you are because I already know where you are. I want you to see you. I want you to see whether those amens, hallelujahs, praise the Lord, isn't God good? All that, all that good Sunday talk, I want to see if we got any meat on it. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to give you a test. Right now, you passing the test God gives you, the test he brings into your life? Or when the test comes, do you throw away your faith? Because you didn't have a faith in the first place. You just had the right Christian vocabulary. You had learned to speak Christianese. Because, you know, Christians have their own vocabulary. You know, we can, we can talk a good game. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. You know, we got, we got it going on when it comes to the right sayings. But what happens when it's raining, thunderstorms? Well, it says in verse 41, then, then they became very much afraid. Hmm, let's pause there for a moment. Jesus says, why are you afraid? What were they afraid of? The storm, their circumstances had them panicking. But when they saw Jesus do his thing, they were very much afraid. What's the point? God wants you to fear him more than you fear what's wrong. He wants you to fear him more than you fear your circumstances. He wants your fear of him and his power to be greater than your fear of your problem. Now, no, you can't deny your problem. You don't act like the virus isn't there. The finances aren't shaky. The money's not funny. You don't, you don't act like pain isn't real, that you're not hurting physically, because then you would be lying. But he doesn't want you to limit it to that. He wants you to fear him. That's why there's so much in the Bible about the fear of God. They said when they saw him work, they said they were very much afraid, and they started talking to one another. And here's what they said. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? <laughs> you see, they didn't know who they were dealing with. They, they, this, 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 this shocked the socks off. Who is this? Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who you're dealing with? Um, let's talk about who Jesus is for a moment. He was born of a virgin. Because he was born of a virgin, there was a human part of his birth and a divine part of his birth because Mary's egg was fertilized, the scripture says, by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is the most unique person that's ever lived because he's one person with two natures. He has a human nature. He has a divine nature. That's why it can be called one time the son of God and the next time the son of man because he's fully human and he's fully divine without any mixture of sin. We call this in theology the hypostatic union. It's defined for us in Philippians chapter 2 when deity, all that he has ever been throughout eternity, was poured into a container called humanity so that he could reveal God to us and come here as the sinless savior 
to die on the cross and rise again from the dead. So he's both at the same time. So what can he do? Well, right here you see it. He can go to sleep because humans get sleepy. But then he can come and put nature to sleep because he's also divine. He can be born of a virgin. And at the same time, the Bible says he created the mother that gave him birth because he created all things. The animals that were in the stall when Jesus was born was created by the Jesus, the baby that was born in the same stall. In fact, the wood that made the manger come from a tree that he made because he created all creation that he had to utilize as a baby. He could get thirsty as a man, but because he's the son of the living God, he can walk on water. He can get hungry because he's a man, but he can take uh, sardines and crackers from a little boy and turn it into a Moby Dick sandwich and feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Oh, he's a man, so he can die. Oh, but as a living son of God, he can get up out the grave. You see, you need to know who you're dealing with. He's the man, Jesus, who's the eternal son of God. What manner of man is there? Who are we dealing with? See, we've dumbed down Jesus. We've made him nice and soft and, 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 and sometimes even weak. We don't know he's the glorified son of God and he is the means to get to the father. That's why we end our prayers in Jesus' name. What, what, we're, what we're saying is we need you to authorize this request. We need you to stand behind what we're asking the big Mahath, the heavenly father, what we're asking him to do. Because the beautiful thing about Jesus is because he's man, he can touch us. Because he's God, he can touch, touch the Father so he can hook the two up. What manner of man is this? You need to know who you're dealing with when you're dealing with Jesus. And let me tell you something about God's testing. He believes in retesting when you fail. He will retest you as many times as you fail. So you keep failing, you will keep getting retest in that same general vicinity until you learn the lesson. So why don't we start passing some tests so we can move on? Now I know in the next grade you're gonna get a new test, but that means you'll have new information to take the next test because he only tests you off the of information he's given you. So it's time now for us to pass some tests, not just take tests, so that we can now go to the next spiritual level. When you and I learn who Jesus is, when you and I learn how awesome he is, when you and I learn how great he is, you see, he knows when we when we he knows when we're playing a game. It's like you can cook meat and it look done on the outside, but you stick that fork in there and you realize it's not done. It had the appearance of being done, but inside it wasn't cooked. So what do you do? You put it back in the oven again until you get it just right. God wants to get us just right. And he's not satisfied with how we look on the outside. Because we look Christian, we look spiritual, we look full of faith, we look like we're growing, we look like we're depending, we look like we're prayerful, we look like we're victorious, because we've got all the right things, hang out with the right people, go to the right church, and we look like we looked apart, but when he sticks the fork in, we're not done because we're not passing the test. God's going to test you, and he's going to retest you, and he wants you to pass, so he can take you to the next spiritual level of development. Uh, corona is, is one of those tests. As you sit home, are you passing the test or are you living in fear? Jesus may be silent, but when he's silent, he's not still. A little boy was on a plane and the plane was in massive turbulence. He was sitting next to an elderly lady who was terrified. She was scared to death, trembling. The boy was playing with a toy. She said, boy, how can you be so calm when we're in this much trouble? He says, well, the reason I can be calm 